What's up, everybody? Welcome back to This Week in Games. This is our week two for the week of October 10th. We have endured through Hurricane Matthew. We have now on the tail end. We didn't really have anything bad. No, nah, nothing bad. We were, like, out of the blast zone. We got so. very lucky. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. All right. How are you? I'm good. By the way, I'm Matthew. This is Dan. Oh, I, I, I'm just going to never announce your lower thirds. Uh, so you just can't why, why must you hurt me like this? Yeah, you put so much effort in. I, I put like 20 minutes of effort in. So I've been reading this uh, How to Enjoy Your Globe thing, and uh, I got a lot of useful tips here about uh, about the globe and enjoyment of it. You want to read some French? Uh, sure. Let's push some French. Mepele des lieux. Les groupes terrestres et construit de deux grands serres de la France. The Equita de Meridian. I was a little upset. Three years of French, can't speak. I was hoping that, um, I was hoping that, you know, it it would, it wouldn't have worked out so well for you. No, I'm not above embarrassing myself on, uh, on the internet. So, 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 uh, so, so what you been playing? Oh, I've been playing. Well, we had the hurricane, so I figured what better way to uh, to brave the storm. By the way, I've never been through a hurricane, and I, I'm going to stand by. I've never been through a hurricane after this. No, that, that was, was like that forty was, miles per hour. Yeah, it wasn't bad. And it's very philippine to say, but like. Oh no no! It, here it was not bad at all. No. So I, I didn't fine. really experience uh, any hurricane stuff, but I figured the best way to to brave the storm was to play The Last of Us. So I bought, I rebought. The Last of Us Remastered on PS4, and uh, I jumped right into grounded mode because I'm an idiot. Yeah. It's fun. I've also, I jumped in it because it was on sale, and I had it, and it was like 10 bucks like last week or something. Did but you get the free $10 for PS4? For I don't know. I like Free $10? PlayStation sent me money. Ah. Wait, why? I don't know. Like I'm, I'm dead serious. They sent me uh, like a ten dollar gift card, and we well, think you're really cool. So, yeah, it was it was along those lines. Well, I didn't. I'm sorry. Nope. Wait. So what'd you get with it? I didn't buy anything yet, but I have a ten dollar uh, credit. Well, you could have gotten Last of Us I did. last week. Well, no, no I got ten dollars. I got the Last of Us, and then they sent it to me. So I think it was just like, I think it was like one of those like you spend a hundred bucks in the PS Store, you get ten dollars back. Because I've spent at least a hundred bucks since I got my PS4, hmm. which last is more than I should have. Honestly, Last of Us Grounded is like ridiculous, but it changes everything. It oh, makes yeah, you. It, it makes the game. It makes it what it should be almost. Because if you like, there shouldn't be there shouldn't be any margin for error. Like if you know that you're gonna walk through this room and some dude sees you and just shoots mm-hmm. you, like you should die. That's it's, fair in that world. It's wildly frustrating because I was playing the bookstore part where you go. Like, you sneak through the checkpoint, and then you go, uh, I can't remember where it is, but you, you're in Pittsburgh, and you're trying to get to the bridge, so you sneak through the bookstore. And there's a glitch in the game, I think I was telling you about this last <laughs> night, but if you shoot an enemy through a window, and then go through the door, like, to, you go into the building, and they respawn. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize this until, like, 12 tries in. Wait, so, oh, so you were just not... You clear yeah, so out. You clear the entire room, then go back, and then it would restore. I would be outside, so like the, all the windows are open and like all the doors are open, and it's a pretty big area. So I'd be stealthily like killing all these guys with a bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. But it turns out that there's only four guys in the building. Oh, you just kept. There, there's only four guys in each floor, but depending on where you go, like which entrance you take, that determines where they spawn. So I would go to the right. I take out three with mm-hmm. bow and arrow. I'd go in, take my bows and arrow, like. Uh, arrows back I'd leave go to the front mm-hmm. take out three guys the same three guys <laughs> mind you that I didn't realize were the same three guys get my arrows back like whatever survived and it was go practice to the though it was target practice it was fucking infuriating that's what it was but you've come out on the other side a better a better man no probably worse no. <laughs> more bitter. I'm probably worse off than I was before somehow more bitter yeah so but there was another problem where an encounter doesn't start but the encounter is like six enemies all at once. So I can continue, but I'm going for the platinum. So like they're standing on like the staircase and they can't enter the door and they can't shoot. So they're just kind of like there like. <laughs> oh, it's just people? It's just... just so ready to fucking attack you. <laughs> and like I, I got rid of my like smoke bombs and everything so I couldn't hit them. 
And then it got worse because I, I would leave the staircase to go attack them and then Ellie would glitch in the door so I couldn't get back in the door. So now I'm, it just, I'm stuck in a staircase being shot at on ground and moan. Yeah. That's, not, that's not good. Did you have like a grenade maybe? No. A pipe play. bomb? No. No pipe bombs? Mm-mm. Hmm. Ground and moan does not give you items, period. Ground and moan doesn't give a damn. It does not. I, had, I think I had like three arrows... In like a shotgun shell, and like that is it. It's rough, but I do I do like that the pistol still kills in two, at least initially. Pistol kills in one if you get a headshot. Right. Yeah. Well, I just meant two like body mm -hmm. if you miss or something. It's not the end of the world. Like they it's, they still give you some margin for error, but it's so much thinner than normal. Because in normal you can get shot, eaten, and then you're just like, okay, let me just retaliate. It's fair in a sense because it's exactly what it says it is. Grounded. Yeah. It, it's very realistic in the sense that a gunshot will kill you, a gunshot will kill your enemy. I don't even put any crap... Like, I have not made a single bandage yet, cause, just because I know I died so quickly. Like, there's no point. Yeah, the health kits are bad. Um, I've upgraded my health twice, so, like, health kits are more beneficial now. Oh, that's good. Um, other than that, I really haven't upgraded anything outside of... I think my revolver has a bigger clip now. Or, no, no, no the, the handgun has a bigger clip. Yeah, that's it. That's that's all I got for. It's about grounded. That's about grounded. It, it's removing the heads up display, increasing the. the I hadn't even noticed. Sway. I hadn't even noticed that the uh, he, that the HUD was gone. I thought that was just mm -hmm. part of it. It makes it so much better. It does. But, but no, because I played The Last of Us the first time. I played it on. And you can't mode. use the listen mode either. I yeah, hate the listen. I played mode. it on the first time on normal mode, and I did not enjoy it as much as I am now. Mm -hmm. It, it just feels like it's, it's a more visceral experience. I think and granted it is the right way to play it. More effective. It yeah. really does. Mm -hmm. I very kind of much feel like the I'm point. stepping into yeah. Joel's shoes. But the cool thing is that I'm taking it scene by scene. So like every little mm. every little area becomes a different like challenge. It's almost like yeah. a puzzle. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. Very true. Very true. You want to hop in here? Yeah. So this Did week's this? headlines. Um, there wasn't. That's the only headline right there, folks. Oh God damn it! All right. Well. This week didn't have too, too much. Uh, it was New York Comic Con, so I, I don't know. Not much happened this week. Mafia 3 came out. Paper Mario Color Splash came out. I did not even know about Paper Mario, but uh, Mafia is... I'm trying to think what else. I've heard good things about Mafia so far. There were a couple things that came out. A couple indie games came out. Uh, Be Glitched and Five Nights at Freddy's Sister Location. By the way, Be Glitched, we have, I have a video coming up tomorrow about... Uh, I played it very late in the morning. Very early in the morning, I guess because that's when I found out about it. But it's an indie game on Steam. It's about 10 bucks, And it's one of the most interesting puzzle games I've played in a while. It, it's very, very... It's very difficult, which can I we, like. Uh, can we watch the trailer? Do you, I can pull up a trailer if you want. They have a trailer on their website. Give me one second. I like the art already. We got some dogs, some ducks. It's, it's pixel art. It's very pastel. It's just a very nice game. It's, it's pleasant to play, but it's also challenging. So at no point do I feel, like, childish, I guess. Alright, here's the trailer. Oh, come on, audio. Wait, you got the sky cam? Sky cam. What? Oh, never mind, I thought it was your uh, hands on it. That was part of the trailer. Wait, what? It was like a weird thing, and I thought it was your hands were up there, or the screen rather. Oh no, I, I wish. thought you had the sky cam hooked up. Like it's it's hard to tell the gameplay from the trailer, but basically you have uh, computer modules and compass modules that help you identify where the enemy is in the puzzle, and then you have bomb modules where you have to land at, directly on the enemy to get. So you have to use the like the little icons to pinpoint to like basically. Uh, cross locate where the enemy is and then you have to somehow manage <laughs> to get a bomb over to them okay meanwhile you're navigating this area and you're trying to utilize symbols and certain things to yep. figure out which of the like little sections you have to go into it looks like bejeweled I think that's the point meets like yeah I'm trying to think of uh, gunpoint <laughs> art style ones yeah know. 
but it's it's two girls made this game on their own. Pretty glitched. Yeah, really, really huh. interesting. Very, very uh, intuitive puzzles. Cool. Very much enjoy it. Um, I have not played Sister Location, but after all the shit that he's given us, he trolled us with the, uh, we're going to delay it because it might be too scary. Fuck off. I'm very tired of the FNAF series. I bought it because I want to see what it is. It should have died. I really should have. I bought like, it because I want to see what it is, but I just haven't mustered up the energy to play it. I'll probably do it tonight, but I hate jump scares, and I hate... I just, I, that's like what that it. is. I know. I played the first nights, first and second FNAFs, and I just I didn't care for them. I don't know why I bought this one, because I don't think I'm going to enjoy it either. Well, now, what have you been playing outside of Last of Us? Overwatch and uh, Overwatch season two still kicking, still trying to get above twenty seven hundred. Yeah, I give up. I'm at twenty six forty. I'm just like whatever. But yeah, nothing really. Just that that um, Last of Us grounded. But that's like I'll play it for literally ten minutes, die like three or four times on a single part, and then stop, and then come back and play I think it again. I have a problem because like I'm not. I have never been a rage quitter. So was, those aren't rage quits, though. It's just like, I just don't want to deal with this right now. <laughs> I that's, can't. The, that's the thing. Like, I've never been a rage quitter. So like, I was playing with my sister, and literally I died in the section 23 times. And each time I'm just like, shit, all right. Shit, all right. <laughs> God damn it. Come on. Just kept going back to it. And then finally it's like 2.30 in the morning. I'm like, I forgot to watch Westworld. You did forget to watch Westworld. I didn't. I, did. I actually watched it. You watched Westworld. So it's, I, it's out? I didn't even know it was out. Yeah, so the first and second episode are out, and it's fantastic. Cool. I'm very, very, very much enjoying it. Want to jump into these headlines? Sure. I think, I think you should take this one, because this is more your speed, and I think that you'd appreciate it. That's fair. I was reading this a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Rolling Stone had an interview with uh, Miyazaki, who's the Soulsborne creator. Father, grandfather of it all. What have you? And who's that? Glixel? Who? Glixel? No, I don't know. Oh, it's a Glixel newsletter. <laughs> That's it. I don't well, know who wrote Oh, James. James Malik. Is that you pronounce that? No. Milk? James Milk. See, that sounds even worse, frankly. James Milk of Rolling Stone reports... Once a regular Japanese salaryman working as an account manager at Oracle... Hidetaki Miyazaki, at the suggestion of a friend, gave a little game called Aikotra. It changed his life. See, the, this is why I thought it was going to be more your speed, because I did not know this, uh, this part. Sorry to interrupt. It changed his life. Aiko, as legend has it, inspired him to swap the secure confines of a corporate cubicle for the much less certain world of game development. His first job turned out to be his last. Toki, that's... I, I thought he was um, not out forever. No, 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 I mean, like, this is his job forever. Ah. It's not like... Tokyo Beast from Software, a developer best known for the complex Dungeons & Dragons style Kingsfield and the, newly, and the nerdy Armored Core mech franchise. By the way, I love Armored Core. And Dark Souls. He also did Dark Souls. He's, they're getting to that. Twelve years later, Miyazaki is running the company. Although he was eventually tasked with directing sequels for Armored Core, the ascendance of Hitaki Miyazaki to present... To pre oh, sorry, sorry. The attendance of Hidetaki Miyazaki to president of From Software was the result of two successful original games. The first, Demon Souls, a spiritual successor to the Kingsfield series, which I didn't know. I never but played Kingsfield. Apparently, I, I think Kingsfield was... Or Demon Souls, for that matter. Demon Souls hard. That's a hard game. Probably. Even it just seems like it's, it'd be hard due to the limitations. It's as like, to. This isn't an insult, but it's basically prototype Dark Souls. So, like, there's a, it's a complete game. There's a brilliant story and characters and everything. It's just that... It's like even harder because mm -hmm. they hadn't made the uh, more achievable routes possible. The character builds. See, I mean. All right, so I'm just gonna interrupt real quick. Um, the reason I put this headline up was basically because I wanted to pr show that gaming has become more and more mainstream, especially being featured in a magazine like Rolling Stones. That for the past what forty years, I don't know how long Rolling Stones have been going. But for the past while, they've basically been the zeitgeist of pop culture, and now they're featuring popular Zaki games. Zaki interviews, yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So the interview continues. Um, it's, yeah, it's sorry, I didn't even get him, into the, uh, the, the Zelda part. It's asking him, like, his inspiration, where did you come from, what did you do? The basic interview stuff, um, like, 
what really brought you to this? Do you really want to do this? Like, are you a fan of gothic stuff? Like, the whole Bloodborne mm -hmm. style? Uh, very interesting read. Well worth reading. I will post a link to it in the chat and or the... Uh, what do you call it? Like, the about section? I don't know. Description. There we go. Words. Words. Anyway. I want to read this quote here, though. Go ahead. Cool. Since the original Dark Souls release, Miyazaki has been riding a wave of creativity that has seen him personally direct or oversee the development of three of the most well-reviewed games in the past few years. They, they're Point coming at they, All right, well, Souls haters yeah. will uh, say otherwise, but I think it's been a pretty solid year. And FromSoft is... I'm, I'm From, so curious. No, FromSoft is doing very I'm well. I'm so curious to, as to what's going to happen in the uh, upcoming year. Maybe an underwater thing? I predicted this last episode. You didn't. No, you didn't. Maybe so when they announce uh, um, Sea Souls, Legend of the Salty Sea Slug, you're going to be like, oh, damn, was right. Salt. The game. That, that's already a game. Is it really? Oh, yeah, it is. I remember Recommended you you to for me. you. Salt. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot about that. Oh, God. Okay. Are we hopping into our second yeah, one here? Yeah, second one. This is you. Let me make sure this is... Okay. We are. So we have the PS Plus update for October 2016. Brought to, you, uh, brought to you by the PlayStation blog, the home for all things PlayStation and blog. You're not wrong, but I did not like how you phrased that. I really do like reading the PlayStation blog, it's just that no, 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 sometimes no, 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 they're a little no, bit not more... That, not that. The PlayStation blog, for all things PlayStation and all things blog. I mean, yeah. Alright. It's not all things blog. But most things blog. Most things blog. So, our full lineup here, on the PS4, we've got the first Resident Evil and Transformers Devastation, which is like a weird sort of animated Transformers game. I didn't really look into that much, that one much, but... Devastation. I remember... Devastation. I remember winning the Transformers, like, the movie video game in an arcade in, like, 2010 or something. How for, was that? For the DS. Was, ah. It was atrocious, and I loved every minute of it. Good. It was basically drive from this point to this point, punch a robot that's much bigger than you, drive from this point to this point, punch another robot that's I don't bigger wanna, than you, I don't and insult. on the way, scan some cars that you can eventually transform into. <laughs> so, so there were certain times I'm like, oh, I'm going to scan this motorcycle. Guess what? You can't. You can't. You just can't do it. You, you can't turn into a motorcycle. Only if you can. The side swipe. Yeah. 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 I'm so upset that you know his name. What the fuck ever? I like Transformers. Yes, Swiper. Anyways, Devastation looks to be what you just described, but as a game, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, Resident Evil 1, Transformers Devastation on PS4. PS3 <laughs> seems From Dust and Mad Riders. From Dust, a uh, survival game about a civilization evolving. Looks pretty cool. And Code Realize Guardians of Rebirth on Vita. That's along too with, many words. Along, uh, that, is a, uh, that is too many words. But along with actual sunlight. Which I was my first oh, yeah, and only review thus far. Big fan of that one. And Actual Sunlight's a really good game. It fucking hurts. It's. Did you see that? It hurts to I play. Actually, something that I, want, yeah. I really want to play together. Lisa. You, no. Oh yeah. I don't, the, I don't, I don't. The, the one of the reviews is a life ruining game experience, <laughs> but it's a positive thing. <laughs> so I'm so in. See, that's a good review. I'm so in. Actual Sunlight, maybe not a life ruining experience, but it definitely uh. It's a good, it was a good experience. And the Vita, it, it's a good place to play it. So mm -hmm. if you have Vita, definitely check out an actual sunlight. Is it only on Vita or is it on PS4? It's on Steam. I know it's on Steam. It's on, it's, it's probably on PS4 as well. I bet it like cross buy or something. Yeah. <sighs> Excuse okay. me. All right. Third topic. Third headline, I should say. Uh, Kerbal Space Program is finally done. Uh, according to Luke Plunkett, one of my, I, I actually really like the stuff that he writes on Kotaku. He's got a great name too. Yeah. Good on you, mate. Kerbal Space Program has been massively popular over the years because it's a smart, funny game, of course, but it's also remained on people's radars thanks to the tireless development and update work of the team behind it. Now that's coming to a close. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread this. Update seems not. While most of the original developers are moving on, a different post in the game's forum says that new talent is being brought on to replace them with the goal of continuing work. <laughs> Wait, <what? laughs> As of this is the most when list, was this updated? Uh, misleading article of all time. I pulled this up this morning and it wasn't there. Okay, um, it's an ever-changing story. Yeah, the, the quote reads: "There's an important amount of new content besides the new update that we're currently working on. This includes more free updates, full expansion pack. Oh, okay, so it's not like the core game is still being built. It's just expansion and stuff. Never mind. 
So the core game is finally finished. I'm assuming it'll be out of beta or alpha very soon. And uh, yeah, Kerbal. It's gonna recess back into the pits of early access. I I've never, never to successfully Kerbled. I I've unsuccessfully Kerbled. I have watched someone Kerbal, but I myself have never Kerbled. My favorite creation was I made like a whirly gig. So two jet engines pointing in opposite directions, and it just spun. <laughs> Did we go anywhere? No. Oh. <laughs> I was like, why uh -huh. won't you lift? And then, and then I realized I didn't have, like, a foil. I just had, like, it on sticks. <laughs> just spinning. And then it was, like, in the center, like... Ah, ah. <laughs> and you were making test kits. It was a test kit. Yep. Well, okay. so I, I'm going to be honest. I read that article earlier. I was talking to him about this, but... I read that article earlier and saw it and thought that it was just done, meaning that Kerbal Space Program was no more. Oh, they yeah. had erased it off of the face of the earth. It's, it no longer exists. It's, it died it's in the, early access. It's the PC of... Steam games of, of space exploration. Yeah, not well, space engineering. So, yeah, this is this is the game that's roughly five years in development. Um, I did not know that. I thought it was like two years. <coughs> no, 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 no. Five years. So five years in development. Damn. But to be fair, like they released it in 2011, and then they've been working. They've been adding to it since then. So it was like playable in 2011. Playable, in quotes. I mean, you could shoot a little. Are they Kerbals? Is that what they're... Like, the little alien is... Are they Kerbals? I mean, it's called the Kerbal Space Program. But, like... So I feel like, yeah, they're Kerbals. Because it's their space program. I really want to figure out how to make, like, a big shoe or something on, like, a thing. Big shoe? No, no, like, I want to make, like, a big shoe and just have it swing and kick the Kerbal into space. <laughs> it's like, three, two, one... See, but he's not going to survive as soon as he escapes the vacuum of orbit. Yeah. Oh, well. I'm going to put that mouse. Here we go. Number four. We didn't even deal with the numbers of the first three. What? I wasn't reading the numbers. Oh. I guess we were. Maybe eh. not. Number four. PlayStation VR launches this Thursday. This Thursday. This Thursday. Um, I'm not getting a day one. I'm not I'm getting a day one day either. One. It's going to be a Christmas thing for me. But I wanted to bring it up because it is an important step. I think that it's going to be... I want to try there, it. There are, two, there are two paths that it can take. It's either going to end up like PlayStation Move, where it just there's no games for it, and it eventually... It doesn't die out, because I think there's always going to be some people making content for it. Mm -hmm. It's just that... So that's where it differs from PlayStation Move. But... Yeah. Uh, the fallacy is that if they don't make games for it, no one's going to want to buy it. But there are a decent list there's, of launch there's titles. There's a lot of games coming out for and it. there's more to come like in the next few months. Yeah. So it is a solid thing. It's just that this is very tip of the spear. Like, it's, This is ground it's, floor. It's not wise to get it unless you w know that it's going See, to be very I, want, I really, really want... You're not going to get... There. Nice. Number one. You're not going to get... You're not going to get very, like... Full length, you know, very many full length games. Resident Evil Seven looks to be one in the in the immediate there future, but it's really just that it's experiences. It's like twenty yeah, minutes to an hour. Ba Batman VR twenty or sorry, it's like an hour. I don't know if you did this, but I remember Blockbuster used to rent consoles for a week. So whatever the number of dollars it was, you could rent a console for a week and a game. I very very much want to rent a VR. Mm. And try it out for a week. That'd be a little weird, though. I don't know. Because like, I, I don't want to commit to paying five hundred bucks. Because I, I need the the camera. I need the set. And I would probably need the controller. So like the the five hundred dollars like package right, right. is ideal. But I don't want to commit to spending five hundred dollars until I know I will enjoy it. Sure. Because like like buying buying a console is a totally different thing. Because you know that you're gonna get like like a. For me personally, like the PS4 and the PS3 are great investments because I now have Netflix, Spotify, Hulu, all of these things like mm -hmm. in one place. I can now have Blu-ray player, and I have like, a, like I leave my PlayStation 3 out in my family room because like everywhere Blu in my family can use Netflix now. Mm. It's not just me on my laptop. Mm -hmm. And then same same deal with my PS4. I can do it only does everything, but because of how niche this is and how narrow the like use is. I can't imagine dropping that amount of money without at least trying it first. The drop? Proud of yourself. Okay, so... Proud of yourself there? Uh, it's not... It's going... It's 
it's not niche per se. It is niche. It's but very niche. My, my whole thing is that it's it's a new way to play, and that's very, very exciting. I'm not disagreeing with no, you at all. I know that you're not going to the impact. It's, it's, it's not practical that, for your situation. It's not practical for many people. Right. It is a very and I think, I think that there should item. be a try before you buy thing. And that's fair, that, and they have, they have trials from places, Sony. But they do have places where you can go. Yeah. They were traveling around, and they I'm sure that like Best Buy is going to have like a thing where you can I sign up. I don't think... Best Buy Vero Beach is gonna have a VR setup. Well, when they do set it up, you'll uh, you'll you'll eat those words. You'll, uh... All right, so let's just go over a few launch titles here. Batman Arkham VR. It's about an hour long, and people people seem to enjoy it. There's a, a part where you are like on the balcony looking down, and that's oh, like yeah. people's main thing. Where you're just like, whoa! Like I saw I saw a very very brief gameplay of this. I just I didn't want to. I don't know how this sounds stupid. I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> And that completely contradicts what it's I like just said. It's like an hour said. game. It's so completely it's... what it contradicts what I just said. Right, right. Um, I didn't really kept check out much. I saw Res Infinite. I saw... Um, what was the other one you sent me? Uh, Eve Valkyrie? Maybe. Eve Valkyrie looks really good. I saw the VR Worlds one. Re oh, I, sent you, I saw Res. I, I saw Res. You, um, just pulling up for them. Yeah, Res Infinite is the one that's like really weird, trippy, wrong, space wrong shooter computer. thing. This Rigs computer. looks okay. I feel like I'm going to get a, a headache from that. I just zoomed out for some reason. It's there the pinch go. thing. Hey, um, it's this computer. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything. Oh, that's just up? It's just up so I can read it. Oh, I thought I was uh, being all handy here. It's okay. Well, they, they, we've talked about it before. They have a full list, and we will link that. I will link that in chat right now. See, I see all these games VR compatible. And I think that would be interesting, especially to play first-person games via VR. Well, have you I heard about Seven and Have you heard rare. about um, uh, cinematic mode? Yes, I've heard cinematic mode. So you um, can play anything. You can play Overwatch in the headset. Granted, it won't be you won't be able to do it, it for too long. Perfect. No, and the resolution will be much and lower. Like, I know that you can't do like this to control no, anything. No, just, just that's what that'd I'm, be awesome. Yeah. Anyways, um, we'll post the full list. So. Look for more in the future. It's going to be something that develops over time. Just real quick, my biggest concern with VR is I am so afraid of the oversaturation of horror games. Because everyone and their mother is going to be like, oh, VR is the perfect thing for horror. It's going to be the greatest horror experience. It's going to be the best horror game, best horror narrative. And that's what I just saw. I'm just like, God. No, no, no. So until it's not, dawn, it's not that I don't want to be scared. Or I don't want to play horror games. It's just I know that there's going to be, like, like with films, if you want to make a film, make a horror film. That's how you get your foot in the door. Because it's easy, it's cheap, it's quick. You don't have to pay for lighting. You don't have to do shit. You just have to do jump scares. <laughs> and I don't know. I, I, about, I don't uh, want the effect of VR to be cheapened by horror, scary by horror. jump scares. Yeah. That's fair. I think there's going to be a lot of different experiences that don't rely on cheap uh, horror tropes. But uh, Until Dawn Rush of Blood is not a horror game. It is an on-rail shooter. And that's why I think it's one of the weakest games out of this lineup. It's, it's literally an on-rail shooter in the headset. So it works. It's unique because you're in the headset. But it's well, that no, one, kind of no one likes on-rail shooters. I like our on-rail shooters in an arcade. Okay. I, I, and this does... As, this as, a quarter is like, eater, as a quarter eater, I think it's a very, very fun thing to do. Especially with a friend. Sure. But VR is not a VR is a hard social experience. It's it's an expensive social experience. It's a VR compatible. It's not. Dun dun. Metal Gear Solid Five VR compatible, baby. Battle Zone also looks fun. Uh, there's another thing up there about it, but it's it's just the tank combat. Okay, you want to hop into our next one here? Number five. Yeah. Um, I want to bring this up. We're going to nerd out about Overwatch. So skip about... <laughs> pull, pull up that... If, if you're not interested in... Um, well, you have to, you, you have to pull up. If you, if I you're don't not, have the... Uh, oh, the related, oh, that's what it was. Related that GIF. Um, All right. If you're not an Overwatch fan, skip let's, like five minutes ahead, and then we'll be done talking about Overwatch. But let's investigate the mystery of Sombra, who has been a possible character. Sombra, meaning shadow. In Spanish, so some sort of sneaky character. Um, there's that been a bunch of stuff. All I know about Sombra, yeah, actually. basically, everyone's like, her ult's gonna be mass stealth for the entire team. I'm like, nope. that'd be unreasonable. Broken, it's fun. <laughs> all right, this is, this is all I got. Yeah, this is this is basically this is Sombra confirmed, this guys. Is, this is Sombra gameplay. Um, Take your time, internet. 
this is somber gameplay. Waiting. This is a new first look at, at, you know, the first information. You can see she's got some sort of dash and a hacking ability. She's, she's unstoppable. She's using those printers, printers. scanners, laptops. It's all hacks. Frankly. Illuminati. It's all hacks. Do you see that duster? That's a good duster. That's a mid cap duster. Can, so it appears that she's some sort of stealth character, but... See, no one, no, no she, like, loop, granted, granted, she's, she's in a, uh, I'm going to say PC Richard and Sons, and no, no one sees her. Oh, there's a Best Buy now. She's in a Best Buy. No, no one sees her. She's 100% undetectable to most forms of sight, uh, probably cameras, hearing maybe, you know? So seen? our first look at Overwatch is anyway. the next character, maybe he a little bit earlier than Blizzard planned, that is, that the supposed leak of the hacker known as Sombra isn't part of the developer's ongoing alternate reality game, which there's just a bunch of weird, like, deep Overwatch sh like shit going on here, but essentially there's a bunch of stuff listed all over around these, uh, it's almost like encrypted material around the maps that indicate that Sombra may be a character, or Sombra basically is a character, but whether or not they're going to confirm her or not. Yep. Uh, let's see. The image appears to come with a partial description of Sombra. According to a rumored bio, she worked with the Mexican Los Muertos gang, seen in Soldier 76 animated short. Muerto, muerto, Until she muerto. attracted too much unwanted attention and had to go underground. It's called Stealth Boys. Stealth Boy. She was later recruited by the talent organization, same group that Overwatch characters Reaper and Widowmaker work for. Uh, she appears to be... It's any Talon. That's what I said. Oh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, this is pretty much... She's got, like, a cool, like, hacking glove. She's got, well, two cool hacking gloves. Uh, I assume some sort of, like, mines on her belt. I can't really tell. And mm -hmm. then a, an SMG. And, uh, and a, that's all we know. A wicked haircut. But we did get Halloween confirmation, or at least a possible leak of... Uh, Dr. Junkenstein. Dr. Junkenstein. Uh, we've got Mercy. Steve, he's Jewish. M Witch, Mercy, and Jack-O-Lantern. Uh, looks like... The, I think it's Reaper. No, no, that's not Reaper. That's uh, Junkrat. No, on the top? Yeah, that's Junkrat. That is not Junkrat. No, nah, that's Junkrat. Hold on, let me see this. What? Mercy? Junkrat, Reaper. No, why does he have like a fireball hand then? Reaper doesn't have a fireball hand. Get the fuck out. I don't know. I don't know how to respond. Well, it looks to be a similar thing to the uh, Olympics system where you get loot boxes and it's a limited duration. So get on that. Save up. Get on it. What do we got next? Oh, Overwatch. Okay. Overwatch over. So that that's their symbol to know that we're, we'll shut All up right. about Overwatch. This is, this is my... Uh, Overwatch. This is me. According to Polygon, uh, Michael McWhorter writes, <laughs> Polybius, the arcade game of urban legend, is coming to PSVR. Now, Polybius is part of the urban myth of the MK Ultra program, which apparently CIA agents <laughs> went to arcades or built arcade cabinets that would secretly microdose people with LSD oh, right, for right. a mind control program. Wait, you want to put on the trailer while we're talking about this? In a second. This looks like some good Now, uh... Polybius was one of those games that has no proof of ever existing except for a few choice photographs that may or may not have been doctored. Hmm. Illuminati. Yeah. And just my inner conspiracy theorist is just giddy. But my arcade game enthusiast in me is just like, oh, this is going to be mediocre. Anyway, let's look at this. It's still playing out of the way. That's weird. I have no idea why it does that. Wait, so is the idea that you're on a tube and you have to rotate around it? Or how so is this, uh, how the is original this Polybius was basically like a vector tunnel shooter. Right, okay. So I played something so go, I played a knockoff. Yeah. Addicting Games knockoff. This on VR, though, is that's this too much. This on VR much. is going like, to be throwing up experience. Yeah. Throwing up simulator. Yes. That needs to be a game, motion sickness simulator. Throwing up simulator. <laughs> You so, paid sixty bucks to yeah. buy it. It's not, it's not anything new. It's not anything exciting. It's just more the mythos behind the game. Right, right. Um, the game itself is fast and tense, but never upsetting, stressful, or unpleasant. 
I really don't like games that make you feel more stressed out when you finish playing than before you start. Despite all its speed and hyper simulation, you actually find in play that the game has a relaxing, evil, mildly th therapeutic effect. <laughs> I can get up grumpy on a Monday morning, but a few minutes in the headset has me feeling happy and serene. Test subjects have described it as feeling like a nice sensation of meditation when they play. See, that's, I feel like I would have the opposite. I would feel like I would get extreme anxiety. LSD <laughs> confirmed. Oh, oh, oh. Well, shit. All right, now we'll buy VR, folks. <laughs> Those things are rigged. Sony's, uh... Sony's poison you, guys. You look like someone that would conspire... Like, with this headband and everything that you got going on, you look yeah, like someone... I'm gonna keep the, the hair on my ass. You look like someone that would conspirize the, the VR headset. Conspirize? Is. Yeah, I, I... Hold on. <laughs> Basically, you look like... Conspire. You, conspirize. Conspire. Look, we're adding words. We have our own night out dictionary. Anyways, you look like someone that would, uh, you know, would do that. Strategery. Stratego. All right. <laughs> that was rough. Moving was, right along. Did you see the, the, I think it was on Polygon. I know that you posted the IGN article, but did you see the Polygon one? I think it's I sent a, it to you. No, uh, on Beyond Good and Evil. I think I sent it to you. No, no. You sent me the IGN one. No, no, no. I had one. It's up. a God, uh, what was it? God help. Beyond that was, that was Kotaku. Yes. God okay. help Beyond Good and Evil 2. So as of October 6, 2016, four days ago, new Beyond Good and Evil game is officially confirmed by Ubisoft. Alex Osborne of IGN writes, following several teases from Beyond Good and Evil creator Michael Ansel, Michelle Ansel, excuse me, Ubisoft has officially confirmed the new game from Ansel in development at its Montpellier studio. We're delighted to confirm that, uh, I'm going to say it so wrong so many times, Michelle Ansel, is currently working with Ubisoft Montpellier on a new Beyond Good and Evil game. A post the, uh, on the official Beyond Good and Evil Facebook page reads, alongside one of Ansel's previous release pieces, a concept art featuring a man and a small pig many suspect is a young page. So, I don't want to play this because it's mostly IGN talking about it, but they didn't really show too much outside of concept art. Um, and I guess... They're not going to show it on IGN. Did you ever play? Anyway, did you ever play the first one? No, I didn't. Um, I remember it's a rare game for the GameCube and I think Xbox. Mm -hmm. That's all I really remember from it. Well, it looks pretty hype. Yeah, I like that rhino. It, it, there's a couple of cool things on it. Like that rhino. That rhino. All right, that's pretty much it for this article. Cool. This one's you actually. This yes. is the one that you sent. Professional player Abadongo, known for just absolutely bodying people with uh, Pac-Man in tournaments. Uh, oh, you mean Anthony Fantano? I have not. Uh, oh, God. Slamthony Dunktano? Danthony Mimtano? Um, we're done here. <laughs> no, so Abadongo, when, when Smash 4 like initially launched and they started having those initial um, tournaments for the top people... Uh, Abadongo rose with Pac-Man, and it was just so freaking cool to watch it. So, he is signed with Luminosity Gaming. Luminosity Gaming. I'm and not familiar with them. I, I, really don't, don't, uh, I, I don't know a lot of professional teams other than, like, mm. your Curse or your uh, CLG, I stuff don't. like that. But, so I don't follow MLG stuff or teams for that. See, there's a bunch of... It, it's weird, though, because there's a Cloud9... But then there's a Cloud9 Cloud for like Overwatch. Isn't there's one Cloud for League? There's one for League. No, but there was, there's one for Overwatch as well. There's one for I think Hearthstone as well. So yeah, they're wide. They're wide. Wait, spread. was Cloud9 the one that did StarCraft? Who was the team that did StarCraft that was like sweeping the nation for like a week and then no one cared again? I don't think Team StarCraft has ever really been a thing. It's more about being a solo. I think you're talking about League. Maybe. I don't. I don't play those games. Nope. I did. Anyways, Pro Smash Bros. Pro Super Smash Bros. for Wii U player, Yuta Abadango Kamawara, has signed with Luminosity Games. This news comes in the middle of the Big House 6 tournament, currently going on in Michigan, and there's been a bunch of other announcements. So, we can see that... Look at how happy he is right here. That, that picture? Look at that oh, picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The That's a face formed... of bliss. So, this Counter-Strike Global Offensive commentator, Launders, signed Super Smash Bros. Melee player, Zoo. And he was in... Zoo was in... A, I think he was the guy in Wombo Combo. Really? I'm like 99% sure. Unless they were playing as him, his name with it as like a joke. Uh, and then well, James You Duck, play as Mewtwo Kong, so that's fair. That's fair. 
James Duckma was picked up by Denial Esports, and Mewtwo King joined Echo Fox. NBA pl- <laughs> NBA players. I thought Rick Mewtwo Fox. King were retired. Nope. He he said he was going to retire, but then he played. Uh, he decided to pick up Smash Four. Um, Focus all of his energy on Smash Four. That makes me really happy because I'm so sick of Melee. I'm so sick of Melee. Yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna let you get on your soapbox about Melee because we talk about this every time. I talk hate about Smash. Melee. Just watch Super Drunk Bros if you want to watch us complain about Melee. Melee. Anyway, let's... Mewtwo King joined oh. Rick Fox's of... He's he's an NBA player, Rick Fox. Now he has his own... Speaking of Steve Aoki... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last week. So Rick Fox is on team and Cake, Mewtwo King. Notorious so. cake thrower Steve Aoki. Bought an Overwatch team. And G2 Esports also signed West Balls. So we see a lot of these top players landing in some really good teams, and I cannot wait for the future of Smash 4 when they inevitably add Geno from Super Mario They're RPG. never add Geno. Geno confirmed, folks. You saw it here. Anyway, let's check out this just... Epic combo. Is this Big House 6 stuff? Or yeah. Big House 5. Big House 5. Just look at this. Abadongo is disgusting. That's dirty. That is dirty, folks. Like Anthony Fantano, like fucking Slam Anthony Dunk Tano. Stuff. All right. That's my favorite one, Slam Anthony Dunk Tano. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, one more. Yours is the next one, also. Where are we going? Wasteland. Wasteland. So, Wasteland is a. Have you ever played the Wasteland series? Nope. So I have Wasteland 2, and I'm not good at it, but I do enjoy it. It's like a grid-based strategy game. Okay. It's basically like... like XCOM? Or Tactics? Uh, sort of, but... Or it's Fallout. More, it, it's it's Fallout. like Fallout. Okay. Yeah, it's the, it's the isometric Fallouts. Got it. But modernized. But I, Wasteland, I did like Fallout 1 and 2. Yeah, they're cool. Mm-hmm. And then, like apparently the dialogue choices are just infinitely more it's ridiculous. Awesome. Um, so Wasteland 3 has met its $2.75 million crowdfunding goal. God damn. Here God come the damn. stretch goals, folks. Um, so Polygon reports, In Exile Entertainment's crowdfunding Michael campaign. Michael again, actually. Is it? Yeah. Nice, our boy. Our boy. Our boy. Exile Entertainment's crowdfunding campaign for Wasteland 3 on oh, FIG. Oh, just got engaged. You see that? Yes. Our boy, our other boy actually did get engaged. A risky move, folks. But also... Hmm? That's our boy. That's our boy. That's our boy. boy. Peaches, if you're watching, you're our boy. Met its $2.75 million goal this week, just three days after the developer launched this latest project. So, there's just a bunch of stretch goals listed after that. But I thought that it was pretty fascinating that a game like this can reach such a crazy crowdfunding goal. This basically just says that there's... A ton of demand for deep RPG, turn-based, grid-style games of yesteryear. Like, mm-hmm. people still demand these things. and But we've also seen crowdfunding prove that maybe letting the consumer have the option to get what they want isn't always the best, because then you end up with money number nine. Yeah. Is that just a fringe case? I don't think so. I don't think it's a fringe case. I think that was just a, a very bad... Well... I sort of misphrased that. I just meant that allowing people to express their demand isn't always good. Well, I'm sure with Wasteland 3, it means that they're going to deliver a fantastic game and people are going to be happy. But with Money Number 9, well, Hyper people Drifter wanted it. was crowdfunded. Cuphead was crowdfunded. Ukulele. Fez was crowdfunded? Um, I don't think so. Sure no, that, no. that doesn't sound right to me. No. There are a lot of crowdfunded games that have come out that are just for lack of a better term, will, they will be iconic in the, in the community. Um, but they're also complete trash. There's a lot of bad... Th- there's, a, there's always going to be a lot of bad to a few good. Mm-hmm. And I think, but I think that the good will outweigh the bad, especially with games like Hyper Light, um, Ukulele... Uh, what, did I just, what did I just say? What was the one that I literally just said? Oh my god, I just said the words. Cuphead. Cuphead's coming out this year. Night in the Woods. <clears throat> All these games. Super. If you'd like to play the Night Owl drinking game, every time Matthew mentions a Night in the Woods prior to its release. I'm excited. Just finish a handle. Fuck off. Just finish a handle. I'm excited. <laughs> no, so I'm just, I think it, it's a good thing, and I think that Wasteland fans are excited that they can, you know, allow the developer to continue. Because Wasteland probably would have died off a while ago if it wasn't for these crowdfunding sources. So I yeah. just think it's fascinating that a $2.75 million goal can be met oh. because this fan base is that passionate. 
Wasn't it uh, Rock Band failed to meet its crowdfunding goal, so they just stopped production? That makes sense. Yeah. The rhythm-based games are dying, and I'm so happy. The rhythm-based games with giant external controllers. <coughs> yeah, I'm not, too, I'm not too excited about any of that. Okay, it's, uh, I'm all set. All right, so I think this is the last headline. Um, it is very speculative, and it is from a not necessarily reputable source. It's just someone that we wouldn't really go to <sighs> for Gary games. Jones from Express.co.uk has basically said the Nintendo NX console pricing handheld details launch titles, uh, they leaked ahead of the reveal. So new, a new retail source has apparently shed light on the uh, NX, including pricing, launch games, and overall design. Online reports suggest that the gaming machine will indeed be focused on playing titles outside of the house. The phrase, interact with your game on the go, is apparently an existing tagline. Other information shared this week includes four launch titles being shown off of the uh, Nintendo NX, including a big Mario game that has yet to be revealed. Already seen a lot of surface on the apparent design of the new console, including that it'll be a handheld hybrid that can be plugged in at home and taken on the move. And it's probably a pizza box, thanks to Papa John's. Do you see that leak? Papa John's confirmed? No, uh, I did no. not. What is this? Papa John's put out a, an ad that's basically like, big things are coming. And it was literally... Oh, the reflection the, of the It was one. a silhouette of a pizza box yeah. opening. And people are like, holy shit, it's the NX. <laughs> it was... Here we go, here we go. <laughs> just... Oh, God. Yeah. NX confirmed. It just... Also Half-Life 3 confirms. Also new Papa John's also confirmed. today. That's today. That's today? Something better is coming. Ten, oh, wait, wait, so the Papa John's. Wait, NX launches today. Confirmed. We gotta go get one. We just, what are we doing? We go to Best Buy, it's just there. <laughs> no one has been told. It's the worst marketing in the history of ever. At Papa John's? NX? <clears throat> I can't, I don't know. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Internet, for that one. So, I'm really excited for the idea of that, but I just, we can't confirm it all. Oh, uh, just real quick. Um, one of the big new details from this resale source is that the Nintendo NX will cost under $300. Space unit will retail at $299, so it's $300, folks. Uh, meaning the NX reveal could see it being priced at 250 sterling pounds in the UK. I'd like to say bullshit to this article. I'm calling the price point at 400 with everything included. And if there's like an extra controller or whatever you need. 400, and games will all be 50, flat. No, because the, the, the Wii U has $60 games. Yeah, but they're, they're forward-thinking. They're about to change it all up. Mm -mm. All right, well, then here's my second theory. We'll opt out of that. 300. Apparently, I, no, 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 no. I'm saying 400 or with, with everything still, but digital only and the cartridges. There's nothing else. There's no... Uh, well, did, they, did they basically say that everything... Our third-party things... This is the problem with the NX. Our third-party things are going to be on the cartridge as well. Because if the cartridge thing is confirmed, well, then how do third-party games work? Are they just going to put them on cartridges? I don't Our know. Our cartridge is actually a thing? I don't know if it's going to be... Uh, it'll probably be a proprietary cartridge. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to license out the Nintendo thing. So I think you're going to see a shift towards more digital releases. Uh, That's what I'm saying. But at it's... the same time, I think AAA titles will release on proprietary cartridges. I don't think you're going to see games like... Um, I'd like to have a Zelda cartridge. Well, I saw I saw earlier Zelda the, NX the, cartridge. The Bound of the thing with and not Bound se the Severed thing coming to Wii U. I don't see games like that ever getting a physical release. Um, right. I mean, did, digital I, games will still be digital. Just I'm just saying. Kind of going back to the crafting thing, like Shovel Knight spiraled, like in, like upward spiral into this just massive popularity. Eventually, got a physical release, mostly. Not to sell more copies, but to really just kind of show off. Because I think it sold substantially more digitally than it did physically. So, I don't see a need for flash cartridge games outside of it being first party. And especially because you can purchase full games through the eShop. I think that I think that the physical media is dying. And that them using flash cartridges is just a way to save money. Mm -hmm. Save money and increase space. That makes sense. And I, I would be excited like, to get a Breath of the Wild cartridge. That'd be really cool. Yeah, especially for, especially so for the like bigger AAA. A, like a half dollar size, you just carry in your pocket. Nice. It's your token. Nice. So yeah, we'll report as, as more comes out, but that's just a good, uh, 
I'm excited for more NX information. So I, I'm just, we, we're recording on everything we can just because it's... There's not going to be much. It's pretty hype so far. I'm sure they're going to have a big reveal eventually. Though. Okay, so this, just last thing on this article, there's one sentence that just baffles me because I don't know what it means at all. The third and final component of the handheld device itself, which comprises a 6-inch, 720p screen, has a low TDP SOC. What? Yeah, TDP SOC. What does that mean? The Bernstein Bear? I don't know. I'm tried. I'm tried. South of Carolina. <laughs> the Bernstein Bears are going to South Carolina, folks. You heard it here. TDP. It's not even close to Bernstein Bears. Okay. All right. You want to so. move to uh, topics? Yeah, let's jump, in, let's jump into uh, the topics this week. What you got? This week, I wanted to look at... Uh, New York Magazine wrote an article in their, I guess, Gamergate section. It's weird. Yeah, I didn't understand when they were making reference to Gamergators. I was, I was like, what is a Gamergator? I don't... Well, Gamergate's like a, the whole thing with the Nina Sarkeesian and the sexism in games. And I, I, oh, that's good. I still really don't understand which side I'm supposed to be on, because I support Anita Sarkeesian, I support feminism in the game, so like, if I'm a gamer gator, is that a negative thing? I do not understand. I really don't. I, I'm you know, still I, very, very confused. I just want to give preface. I didn't even... Uh, I, I'm well aware of all these sexism issues. I'm just not, I wasn't aware that there was an official uh, title for it. Yeah. G Gamergate was the whole conspiracy... Not conspiracy, the controversy that happened a couple of years ago. Um, anyway... So, Jesse Single of New York Magazine wrote, Why the Video Game Culture Wars Won't Die. And I'll just read, I'll read a couple excerpts from it, just because I found it very, very interesting. Uh, the video game culture wars seem to be flaring up a bit. Wednesday, Heat Street ran not one, but two articles on a favorite bugaboo of real gamers everywhere. Artsy, story-focused games which offer scant interactivity and demand little to no skill on part of the player. They're more like films than games, goes the usual critique, and games are supposed to be games. Worse, these games often tackle themes like race, class, identity, and so forth. Inevitably offering up some sort of progressive message, they're political, which is just about the worst and the most annoying thing a video game can be. Now, this past week we played through Virginia. We, we posted the Let's Play of it uh, Wednesday at 3 o'clock. And the game itself is, is a gorgeous narrative. It, it's a gorgeous narrative. It's gorgeous stylistically. It's just overall enjoyable. And I, I agree that it's not a game. There's not a lot of button input. There's not a lot of player It's, a, it's an experience. Yeah, yeah. It's an interactive experience. And there's nothing wrong with that inherently. Um, I agree that the, like, if you're marketing a game... Sorry, mic difficulties right there. And we're back, folks. Um, I kind of lost my place. <clears throat> well, can I... Uh, oh, um, just, just real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, it's separate, so... So, so losing the interactive interactivity of the game itself kind of takes away from the game experience, but the narrative experience is very, very much there and very much alive. So in Virginia... Fitting. Everything's working. <laughs> Everything's working. In, in Virginia specifically, you have this, you, you take control of this person and you're basically guiding her through her day to day life and, and filling in for her. Now, you're not making choices as, you're not making choices for her, you're making choices as her. And granted, they're her choices. Uh, I'm kind of going on a tangent there. Want to jump in? The thing, the thing that bothers me about this article is that I have. They're political, or quote, they're political, which is just about the worst and most annoying thing a video game can be. I disagree. There's a great errant signal video called Keep Your Politics Out of My Games, which is just about how everything created ever is going to have some level of politics involved. And games are political, and they always will be, always have been, because the creator brings an angle to them that will always be guided towards one side. Yeah. Like, even at the most base level, Tetris. games are political. Tetris uh, was uh, is a good example in my case because when they developed Tetris and they were selling it not selling it to uh, Nintendo but they were talking to Nintendo about how to sell Game Boys the person behind uh, Alexei Paktov I can't remember his name 
um, he said to Miyamoto, he said, if you want to sell the Game Boy to kids, package it with Mario. If you want to sell it to everyone, package it with Tetris. <clears throat> right. And that, that's an inherently political thing. Keep your poop out of my jar. What? <laughs> <laughs> Keep your politics out of my game. No, that was a suggestion, which means people have searched that multiple times. Keep your, uh, keep your poop out of my jar, you know, frankly. Yeah. Uh, oh, my God. Okay. You two need to take a break from just existing for like a day. For like two days. Two days. Hello, Broggle Snar. Broggle Snar. We, we get a song? We, we, we will investigate that after we get through the uh, articles. Yes. But yes. Yes, we can. Anyway, um, I'm going to go just a little bit further down. Uh, Hicks decrying the rise of walking simulators. The quote reads, These types of games are beloved by feminist frequency types who hail them as brilliant alternatives to the male power fantasy inherent in most big-budget violent games. Many jaded liberal Gen X reviewers inflate the scores of these titles, saying that there are finally games made for adults, in quotation marks, chiding the wider industry for its perceived immaturity. Reviews of these games are often polarized, while, progressive, while the progressive cabal of reviewers are tripping over themselves to praise walking simulators, others score them incredibly low. The underlying sentiment among these low, sc low scores seems to be that because these games try so hard to be films, they should be compared to them, and unsurprisingly, they rarely hold up. Now, I... I, I, I really just don't like this article. No, I, I, but I think it's important. I, I, it's... It's a very strange and divisive article, but it's very important to what, to the state of the game industry at the moment. Walking simulators are incre becoming more and more popular. That's, there's no doubt about it. With VR experiences, you're going to see a lot of more walking. You're, you're going to see a lot less interactivity in games and more narrative-driven, more f cinematic experiences, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a negative thing. Um, I agree that the reviews are very divisive, and you see a lot of people jumping to say this is the greatest thing ever. Like with Fire Firewatch, it was very, very enjoyable. Um, but so many outlets were preemptive. Like this came out in February, preemptively saying game of the year, game of the year, game of the year. But there was such little game to it, and and the Telltale. Um, oh God. Please leave that here. <laughs> The, the Keep your politics... Oh, I don't know if you're here for this. Keep your politics out of my Twitch. Yes. I swear. <laughs> Boy, I swear. Boy. <sighs> I lost my train of thought again. <laughs> oh, my God. Take it, you ruined everything. Damn it. Damn it. Oh, we're back to this again. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that you preemptively jumped the gun saying game of the year, but there's such little gameplay. And things like the Telltale series are fantastic narratives. They're very interesting choose-your-own-adventure stories, but they're not games. And I know that sounds so negative. They're not games. You don't... There's no... There's minimal interactivity. And while I loved... They are games. The Wolf Among Us... No, I disagree with that. I disagree with that a lot. The, it's, a, the, it's a video game. The Wolf Among Us... It's a different video. Was, it was a video choose-your-own-adventure. It wasn't a game. No, it wasn't a game. <laughs> It wasn't a game, and, and the reason I say that is because there were arbitrary lose states. There, there were arbitrary lose states. There was no, like, you couldn't have completely removed the lose state, and it wouldn't have affected the overall experience. It would not have affected the narrative. It wouldn't have affected the world. I gotcha, I gotcha. I'm berating, and we're going on tangents now. We'll get back to that. Because I think you had a good um, point there, and I don't want to distract you with Wolf Among Us. Is it a game or not? Yeah, that's, I mean it's relevant but, but to what it's, 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 it's kind of relevant. Yes. So, uh, moving on, uh, here's Chong complaining about the positive critical reception of Virginia, a recently released story-focused thriller in which you play as a young African American FBI agent. It's a game which embraces a style of dreamy weirdness that is very reminiscent of Twin Peaks. Again, we played it this week, and both of us. I I, I don't want to speak for you, but I think you enjoyed it. I think that it was a fun experience, and it was a fun to do. It was a fun experience to share, especially. Um, but he, the, the quote reads, Designed to be akin to a silent film, it's hard to really tell what's going on, given the lack of cues, non-chronological storytelling, and sudden dream sequences. Virginia tries to kindle any nostalgic feelings you might have for 90s TV shows like The X-Files and David Lynch's Twin Peaks, but it fails to grasp any of the aspects that made these shows great, namely the chemistry between characters. Can I... Can I? Please. Uh, she, 
this again, this article just keeps hitting the wrong spots for me because I don't think that Virginia, it, it was supposed to take a note from Twin Peaks and X-Files. Like we, we, we were saying that throughout the entire Let's Play. Mm -hmm. It's just that I, I think she kind of missed the ball here, where it, but it fails to grasp any of the aspects that made those shows great, namely the chemistry between the characters. It wasn't... I enjoyed all of the characters in Virginia because you were given so little to go off and you just had to make assumptions and roll with it and then the, get, the narrative was presented to you. I don't think that it was trying to be a TV show because it only had two hours to grasp you. So why would it... It can't spend too much time on character development when it was trying to express the entire narrative. It, it's not what Virginia is, and I just think she really missed the ball. On, yeah, I, um, on, on her assessment of of the way it plays. Yeah, I I think that there there's a lot to be said about the way that the narrative was told and the way that it drew influence from, because I didn't see it as trying to emulate Twin Peaks or trying to emulate X-Files. I saw it taking cues from it with the paranormal or the uh, strange occurrences. But, I, I, like, the details were in the subtlety. And if you really played the game... Like, I, I went through it uh, two more times after we played it together. And there's a lot of things that if you are not looking, you will not see. But that's the point. Mm -hmm. So the first time, you're playing an FBI agent, and you're supposed to be this very, very adept detective, basically, solving things. And the first time you go through it, you miss things. So the missing child, you feel like it's your fault. You feel like you can't solve it. You feel like you can't do this because you're not looking. And I think that there's, there's a lot to be said about uh, these narrative-based games where you you playing a blank slate character and you fill in the blanks for yourself. So playing as FBI agent, I don't remember her name at the moment. Larissa Nicole. Probably. It's not it's probably that. It's not it. Are you sure? Do you want, you want to double check? That was I, Marissa. I it, Marissa. I think, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, sorry. You're, you're right. You're right. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to continue reading this article for a minute. Um, Sorry, it's, most gamers don't give a crap about this culture war. In much the same way, some people see Transformers but not Memento, others see Memento but not Transformers, and yet others happily see both. Gamers defined, as That's it should true. be, as people who play video games, have a wide range of interests and preferences when it comes to video games. Naturally, there's a big market for so-called AAA games, your Gears, your Halos, your Final Fantasies, but there's, uh, then there is for typically quirker, quirkier, quieter fare like Virginia or Gone Home. I thought you said porkier. Porkier. But it's important to realize while the same normal snobbiness holds within gaming that holds within other sprawling fan community, the people snarking about one or the other's preferences all the time, most gamers, like the vast majority, don't view this divide between real gamers and walking simulators as particularly meaningful. People play the games that they like to play. If I want to unwind with some mindless fun, I'll play Super Meat Boy, which is brilliant. If I want to think about the relationships and family secrets and how three interact, how the three interact, I'll play Gone Home, which is also brilliant, but in a totally different way. That's the perfect. That's the perfect way to explain. That's it. a good assessment of walk simulators. But there, there's such a willingness to criticize in the media communities that I think is creating this, this air of toxicity, which you uh, were alluding to earlier. It's harmful too, because it really the, is. It, it really is. The, and this is this is what I say about No Man's Sky as well. I think it's. It's harmful. I mean, that game's a whole different case, so maybe it was bad to bring it up. But over criticism of stuff like this, just be, just because something's different and people just bash it, makes developers scared. So there's less innovation. So I think we yeah. need to have people making these bold moves, like No Man's Sky, like Virginia. But you know, I'm not saying that they should all we get the perfect in an ratings. Era of hyper criticism because of how much stuff there is, and we want everything to be the biggest and the best without accepting. The things that are good but not great, right? Because, and this this might get me chastised on the internet. Oof. I liked Mighty Number no. Nine. I will never play it again. Oh, I'm just gonna head out. That's, I'll, uh, that's fine. I'll finish from here. Uh, I'll see you later. Watch the fan. Don't don't hit your head. Right, I'll see you later. No, I, I enjoyed oh, we're playing with... Mighty Number no. Nine, but it's not a game I will ever pick up again. I liked that brief moment of. This is Mega Man. This is exactly Mega Man. It's kind of bad. It's kind of not the prettiest thing, but it, it, it's 
It was fun to jump and shoot. It's like a murderer took Mega Man skin, robot skin, ripped it off him, and then just wore it. Yeah, that whatever. bastard. But it was. Yeah. Yeah. But everyone was so, including myself, was so quick to criticize it because of everything that went with it, and I think that it got. I don't think it necessarily got what it deserved. I think it, it deserved a little bit more love than it got, but because of the promises and the, the hype surrounding it, it, it very much tanked. And then contrarily, um, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture was lauded and praised, and all of these... It won like a BAFTA. It, was. it, it won a fucking BAFTA. And, and that, it, is a, that is a, a weird example of what we're talking about, of, of people being overcritical of the narrowed games. Mm -hmm. Like Firewatch. People, people I think it's, it's a polarizing thing. And that's what this article was hitting on. Um, that it's very polarizing. That we have these people that could Firewatch a 5 and say that, and can see the limitations of the story and everything. But then we have these people that experience it. Like just playing, yeah, playing it through but, that first time with you was fucking wild. That was a great game experience. Yeah, it, I, I think, I think but, it's... I think the way that people look at games now is such a strange thing because there's such a variety of games, there's such a variety of experiences that looking at it in one way, you can't, you can't look at these things objectively anymore. Mm. It, it has become a medium, much like film, much like music, much like television, where it's all in the eye of the beholder. So I, I think that you're, go you're going to have your IGNs, you're going to have your Polygons, you're going to have your GameSpots and your Games Radar, who are th like the dominating force in these communities giving these games higher scores because they have such a variety of people reviewing things. Mm -hmm. They can so go to their guy who plays Walking Simulator. They can go to the Walking Simulator guy and say, hey, write something about this, tell us what you think, why would people enjoy it? If, if they enjoy Walking Simulators, what will make them enjoy it? If they don't, what will make these people? What will these people who play real games enjoy in this walking simulator? Right. And, and especially with, uh, I, I really want to give credit to IGN, especially with the reviews at IGN. Uh, there have been some games that I have had zero interest in, and I read the review, and the reviewer is just very, very honest in their description. There has been some other times like Bioshock Infinite. I don't, I don't want to get into that, but there's there's a lot of times where the reviewer is very honest in their review, saying. If you don't like side-scrolling platformers, this isn't the game for you. Why, why would you spend 20 bucks and buy this? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a great story. There's this, there's that, there's this. If you want to play for those things and can get past the side-scrolling platformer, definitely get it. And I've been like, huh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, that sounds like... If you I, can appreciate it as a whole instead of yeah. just a specific genre. And at the same time, genre the same time, haters. I think they see, like we don't we don't play Call of Duty yearly, but we can respect people that do because it's, it's it's what gets their end off, you know. It's, as a person, as, as someone who plays games, I will make fun of my friends for what they play, not because I disrespect my friends, but because it's fun to make fun of your friends. Oh yeah, no, you hate on me all the time for playing, uh, you know, like anything that. by From Software. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts every time. Like I, I literally get like, a little more. Uh, there's like some stones in my heart. Just, you and turn more. <laughs> slowly progressing salt. <laughs> yes. Was I, there anything else you want to touch on on the article? I think we tackled just, it pretty well. Just yeah. Just last thing. Um, she, she had good points, but it, there I, was some of it that was I think mis misguided, misunderstood. I but, think the last thing that we should just talk about is that we live in an era of hypercriticism, and criticism is good for getting better, but being critical for the sake of being critical has always been negative. Because I, I read the, the quotes that we read earlier, they're not talking about the games and what will make the games better. They're talking about the media outlets and why they're so willing to either berate or suck the them. dick of suck naked dick of oh, a, sorry, a developer software. Right. And, and there's no criticism. There's nothing saying, like in these quotes, there's nothing saying what will make these games better. They're all mm -hmm. saying... What's wrong with them? What, what's wrong with them and why we shouldn't bother. Right. Because so, na narration-focused stuff is definitely going... Did you post the link? Like, what's that? The, this article. Oh, no. Okay. We'll I'll post, post that up in, 
chat right now. Narration stuff is expanding. Matthew's bringing up earlier how VR is going to enable that to be expanded as well, just because there's less room for gamey mechanic games, and it's going to be a lot of experience. See, and, and VR just lends itself to I, more of a story focus. I think... I, I disagree. I think VR lends itself very much to more mechanical games, but the technology is not there yet. No, I didn't say it was leaning towards mechanical games. I okay. said it was leaning more towards narration games. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm disagreeing with that. Oh. I, I think that it's leaning... It's Right now, it's leaning towards more narration games because that's, that's something that you can produce easier. But I think once the technology catches up to where we eventually will be, you will see a lot of more mechanical games and a lot of... You're going to see less experiences and more games, which I, I think is the positive in this. Okay. Anyway. Do we have time to go through both of our articles, or do you just want me to do one? Yeah, we got time. Okay. So let's hop into a deep dive on Severed. This is published by Gamasutra. You know, the, I don't read them a lot. It's... I'm going to be honest, I went back, because I had, I, I'd used Gamma Sutra in the past, but when I went back on there recently, I thought that it was just an abandoned site, because, <laughs> it, like, the text and everything, yeah, right, it, just looks, got... it looks a little old, right? But they actually have some pretty good stuff here, so, Game Design Deep Dive, How Dark Themes and Bright Art Collide in Severed. I think that video is just the trailer, so we don't really have to watch it, mm -hmm. but what I do want you to pull up is this original Severed pitch video. Hold your horses. I didn't realize you wanted me to do that, so I'll do that right now. Who? Augusto Quiano. I'm sorry for butchering your name. Concept lead at Drinkbox Studios. And they published Guacamole and now recently Severed. Now, Guacamole is fantastic. I Hello, really I'm Augusto. I present, present outlandish ideas to the very talented team at Drinkbox Studios. And usually, after much struggle, we end up with an amazing video game. I'm responsible for pitching the world and characters for Guacamole and a crude version of what Severed became. So if you don't know, Severed is a... It's like Fruit Ninja, if Fruit Ninja was given proper I game no mechanics. I don't know why it does that. That is a lot. It's like a fruit... All right, so... I, and I don't want to call it Fruit Ninja. And that's the thing is that... That's the reason I bring this up, is that... We saw this with Zelda... Um, I can't... I'm blanking so hard on the name. Skyward Sword. There we go. Um, with Skyward Sword, we saw that the one-to-one... -one, I love this just generic, like, pitch text. Mm -hmm. The... Aerial sensor... <laughs> 14 point font Yep That's more like 16 or 18 I think Frankly Is that Helvetica? I think it's Helvetica <laughs> I think it's Comic Sans It's definitely not uh, yeah, You just made me lose my point so hard Oh god No so The most eloquent use of like motion controls On the on the Wii at least Was Skyward Sword for me Just because the one to one With the Wii Motion Plus Was absurd Like the boss creativity That everything was built around it So that's why Severed works so well As a touch game because most touch games, and at least in my opinion, are pretty trash, right? So these games are... They're very generic. It's usually just something to get by. Like, it's not intuitive. But Severed... All right, so... Wait, we can... Uh, all right, no, I'm, I'm sorry. just going to this run. We haven't gotten to the uh, good part. Yeah, this, is, this is not the game. This is the pitch, just to preface. If you're like, what the fuck is this game? Like, someone made it in no, this is, This is the proposal, and honestly... Um, I'm fascinated by it because it shows, it really does show where everything comes from. Because <laughs> <laughs> frankly, going from frankly, that to I what Severed is, frankly, it's fantastic. Frankly, I got the stuff, if you didn't know that. That's... I got the stuff. <laughs> no, but no, no, so, so Severed... Plus 200 Lumberjack. So we can, we can pull up these other images later, but the touch controls, did you play Severed at all? Did I show it to you? Yeah, I played Severed. Okay. I didn't play through it, I played it at your place. Right, right. So it's got, they basically built everything around interacting as a touch like platform, and mm -hmm. it works very well. It's just that, um, well, the, the specific deep dive is about the art style, but what I wanted to bring up is just that it's, it's the most eloquent use of touch controls, because I can say something like, oh, it's the fruit ninja of like RPGs, because there's RPG elements to it. But when I say that, it's, it's endearing. It's not that, because fruit ninja, sure, there's people that play fruit ninja, but that, that mobile market is not mm -hmm. indicative of a good game because a lot of trash does exist on the mobile market. A lot of it's tappers. Right. But um, this is something that could not, I don't think, at least in my estimation, could not have run. It's a Vita exclusive. I don't think it could have... I, they could have released a version on, on mobile phones, but I don't think it would have had the eloquence that the Vita version does because it's a whole graphically experience. Or 
No, not graphically. No, I'm saying they could cut it down to whatever they need to. But mechanically, playing it on the Vita, healing is done by certain spells. Playing it on the Vita makes it feel proper. If it was released as a mobile game, I'm sure it could run because of the touch controls, but you know, it, it just works with the... I, I yeah, like so I remember when I played Severed, um, it, is, it is a simple game, and I don't mean to criticize it in that sense. It's a simple game. It's very basic in its mechanics, and that's where the elegance comes through. Because what it does, it does so well. Like, it, it does few things, but it does the few things that it does very, very well and very, very uh, pretty. I guess that, that was a poor way to phrase that. But I think that with mobile games and touchscreen games, outside of things like the DS, which I think had a lot of... What are we doing? I'm just switching it up. We got the idea of the pitch, but I wanted to show some actual... Again, this computer. Oh, yeah, right. Damn it. <laughs> Dang it, Bobby. Sorry to interrupt oh, you. Oh, what did I just do? Your point. Ah, oh, cool. Firefox crashed. Uh, anyway, yes. back to us. Yeah, what were you, what were you saying there? Um, like, I remember the DS. The DS had very intuitive controls uh, with Sky, not Skyward Sword, with Phantom Hourglass, mm -hmm. because you controlled Link through Moving the... It. Touch screen. I did not like that. Oh, I like that a lot. Oh, yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> I, I think that with touchscreen games, you have such a limitation because you have you basically have eight directions: up, down, left, right, and then the in betweens. Mm -hmm. And then you have tapping and sometimes pressing. Right. So there, there are very, excuse me, very few. There are very many limitations to touchscreen games. And when you add things like the Vita with like the buttons and the sticks, mm -hmm. you increase the threshold. But things like mobile games specifically, you have to do so much with so little that it's almost unfair. Okay. Um, the fault that we you. Yeah. I don't think that's uh, maybe not. Cool. Go. Firefox. The the Wii U does it too. Like like um, with Pikmin three. You can control like the Pikmin from the touchscreen kind of thing, mm -hmm. or you see the map where everything is. And I think that using a touchscreen or a second screen is a very good idea, but the limitations really, really hinder a lot of experiences, and that is not the case in Severed. Um, Severed game, games like Severed, games like Downwell, games like Monument Valley, um, what's the other touchscreen game? Like in depth touch, uh, Super, Super Brothers? Super Brothers? Mm -hmm. What? I don't know. Super one. Brothers. Kiwanuka. That's what I'm thinking of. That was an iOS game. Um, oh, I know Sword and Sorcery. I didn't realize that was iOS first. I thought that was Steam. Nope. See, when you. Well, didn't this have virtual buttons? Yeah. Yeah, I played it on iPhone. I'm thinking of games that were used specifically just as opposed to, like, inputs. Mm. So, like, with Severed, Severed, you could probably play entirely via touchscreen. But you need to, like, move forward. You know? Minus the navigation, yeah. which could be relieved by touching. That's right. Like, arrows. Um, Downwell can be played with controls, but you don't need controls, especially with the iOS, like, the, the screen in the iOS. Kiwanuka is another game like that, which this came out a while ago, so it's not, it's not really worth pulling up. It doesn't hold up too well. But at the time, it, it was very intuitive with how it used controls and how it used the multi-touch of the iPhone screen. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, Fruit. You mentioned Fruit Ninja earlier. Fruit Ninja is such a simple concept, but I, I, Fruit Ninja could not be pulled off anywhere else except for a touch screen, which makes it so. Which is what makes it so good. Right, and I feel like that Severed. Like my reference to Fruit Ninja in relation to Severed is that they took the like brilliance of the precise touch cuts but then applied it to an RPG so you have these fights that end up looking like a blend of Fruit Ninja and um, Scarred Sword because mm -hmm. the enemies will post up we have defenses specific, in three directions specific area to you swipe. have to slice like that but yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so if you want to read more there's a bunch of detailed stuff on like the art style and did how you they, post that? yeah or, no, no, I got it um, so there's a bunch of stuff on the art style and how they 
uh, ended up putting like brighter art to make things look weirder. And the shroomsters were like the development weird. process, basically, and how it came to be. You're right, but it's pretty thick, so I don't want to. It's, no, anymore. it's very, very interesting and very worth. It's very worth reading if you are interested in game design or want to understand the the tedium and the difficulty that goes into making like excellent games. Right. Um, I do not think Severed will be game of the year or anything like that, but I, th I think it's it's worth playing and it's worth looking at, especially it, from a critical, it also proves, critical analytical standpoint. It also proves that Vita is a great system because Drinkbox made a Vita exclusive. They could have gone out and done Guacamelee 2 and made probably triple money, but they stuck with it because they know that Vita is worth defending. Guacame Guacamelee is a whole other thing. Hashtag Vita for life. I'm not going to buy a Vita. Probably ever in my life. All right, well, that's about it for, for the severed. Do you want to hop into your Westworld business? Westworld. Oh, yeah. So I'm kind of on a kick with the narrative structure and the overall uh, media today. So I recently started watching Westworld, and it very much has... The, the world of Westworld is a game, not a video game. In a sense. Wait, say that sentence again, please. The world of Westworld is a game. Okay. All right. I'm in. I'm so, in, folks. Alex Osborne of IGN uh, writes, in addition to being based off of Michael Crichton's original 1973 film, so basically the dude who wrote Jurassic Park made another movie, but instead of dinosaurs, it's uh, robot cowboys. Um, <laughs> it, that's 100% true. HBO's new drama series, Westworld, draws inspiration from a number of video games, including Bioshock, Red Dead Redemption, and Skyrim. In an interview with Vice, Westworld showrunner Jonathan Nolan said he believes, quote, a lot of interesting storytelling that's happening right now is in video games. And while he's never worked in game development, he's fascinated by the concept of writing a story in which the protagonist's actions are not part of the story. And this kind of ties into the video game culture uh, and the Miyazaki article from the beginning of the show. How more and more video games are permeating mass pop culture. And granted, there are, there are millions and millions of people playing video games. There's also a large number of people who look at video games still as a toy or a childish thing to do. Where you and I, 23 and 22 respectively, fuck, I'm old now. Uh, I can't be old. Now. Yeah. We've been playing game. I've been playing games since I'm like two. So I've been playing 20, 20 years worth of games, basically. And I, I have seen from ev everything from like Pajama Sam. In, in we need to look of, that up. <laughs> that sounds like a little from thing. Pajama Sam to things like The Last of Us and uh, Amnesia. Like like. Oh, Pajama Sam, killing it. No need to hide when it's dark outside. Anyway, um. Another aspect of... Wait, it's a walkthrough. Yeah, it's... Can we just sit here and walk? I really don't want to because that'll make me sad because someone made a walkthrough for Pajama Sam. Like... Wait, did I play this? No, no Like, one of the too... easiest games to ever exist. Are you sure? This looks pretty it's intense. It's literally for four-year-olds. Yeah, he's finding that flashlight, though. And it's not a negative thing. Yeah, well, do you not understand? Look at his socks up. There was, there was a, um... <laughs> I think it was GDQ that did, like, Putt-Putt Jr. speedrun. Absolutely hilarious. Pot -pot yeah. yeah. Um, nice. Another aspect of video game storytelling that no one finds interesting relates to the NPCs of a game like Skyrim, which boasts multiple non-playable characters inhabiting a world where the player isn't always the center of attention, each with their own, quote, lives that happen whether you're there or not. Nolan also mentioned the Bioshock series, noting that he listened to Ken Levine's Bioshock Infinite commentary and the affect... Ugh. The affection that game developers and designers develop for their characters stood out for him. Now, in the pilot, you see that in the pilot of Westworld, and this, this really isn't spoilers because I think it shows in the trailer, you see the engineers, the developers, interacting with the uh, inhabitants of Westworld, the, the hosts, as they call them, and basically resetting them for the next, day's, uh, the next day of guests. So they're wiping their memory, they're asking them what happens, did they do this, did they do that, run diagnostics, blah, blah, blah. And they're checking these characters, these hosts, for all of, basically errors mm -hmm. and glitches, and they're debugging the systems, and they're removing ones that don't work, they're, remo they're putting in new ones that do work, they're putting in updates and all these. 
it's like it's like watching a video game developer develop a game but personified and I just I really enjoyed that hmm. I don't know do you have HBO Go? Um, yes you I, should, I still use HBO Go though I just have it all hooked up you should definitely watch it because it is this world. yeah it, it, there's two episodes out right now but Anthony Hopkins Ed Harris uh, Luke Hemsworth I think is in it the guy from Casino Royale who played the CIA agent who just just hammered your chips. You're the only one who could stop him. I did not enjoy Casino Royale. What? Or no, no, sorry. I enjoyed Casino Royale. What was the other one with the new, uh, with our boy? There's three. Spectre was trash. Oh, the Spectre was bad. Spectre was bad. What was the second one? Quantum, Quantum of Solace. Quantum, Quantum of Solace was also... It was okay. Welcome back to James Bond cast. Your favorite James Bond podcast. Let's do that instead. That's okay. Like, are you all set here? Yeah, um, I basically... I get what you mean, though. I just wanted to really just draw more attention to the fact that video games are slowly, slowly but surely coming into mass media and pop culture more and more. Definitely. And I think that with things like VR and with things like mobile gaming, you're going to see a lot more people who play video games and will eventually un- come to understand the, the impact that it's had on our culture. Sure. We're going to have to have a discussion probably next week about um, mobile games just because it's fascinating. But we won't go there. Mobile games is a nightmare. Too much to think about right now. There's like five good ones. But they're also important. Like they break through. Like both of my parents are just (sighs) playing mobile games now. If I see another person playing like Bejeweled or Candy Crush, I might scream. I hate Bejeweled. See, Bejeweled is nice though because it's more of an arcade game because they don't hit you with the... uh, Microtransactions. So I thought they did. Else. What am I thinking of then? Candy Crush. No, no, no. There's another one that I'm pretty sure is like Bejeweled. Like Bejeweled <laughs> Legends or something Bejourno. like that. Bejourno. <laughs> it's Bejourno. It's, it's French for pizza. It's not. <laughs> it's French for pizza. It's not. Oh, I lied. Nice. Final uh, little topic. My last little before thing Before we jump into it's our big... Uh, it's so, not a really big thing. Just our closer. So... You want to pull up this? You want to pull up this article? You want me to pull up? I mean, you don't have to, but there's. You want me to pull it up? No, you don't have to worry about it. Never you mind. Pull it up? Never mind. Don't don't pull it up. Don't pull it up. Yeah. All right, he pulled it you up. You want me to pull it up? <laughs> you want me to pull it up? I'm pulling it up. All right, but you have to get to the part that I'm at. Right underneath Linking Crusader. Found it. So if you don't know, Darkest Dungeon is a turn-based thing where you have a party of people all in different positions, and you go through. <sighs> And they get like afflicted with different illnesses, like depression or. Oh, I gotta get that stretching. Like, really. Uh, oh yeah. Welcome to stretch cast. <sighs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> that was so unpleasant. Good. So they get afflicted with different illnesses, and it's all really, really sad. But people enjoy it. But there was a part in this article that I wanted to bring up, because I think they kind of missed the ball on analyzing souls. Oops. And a quote from. Ethan Gack of Kotaku. Ethan Gack? Really? <laughs> yep. Interesting. Contrary to the sadism of games like Dark Souls, which is meant to be fought and eventually mastered, the pain brought by a game like Darkest Dungeon is meant to be invited, respected, and reveled in. Whereas other games have patterns that can be memorized and navigated, the consequences spawned by a random number, gener- number generator are unpredictable and unforgiving. It was this, 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 this. Anyways. So, I agree, and from what I've seen, I've never played Darkest Dungeon, but I've seen, like, a solid amount of uh, gameplay from my boy Northern Lion. Check out Northern Lion. Mark Brown did a really good video on uh, the morality of it. Mm. I'll check out that as well. Um, but I, I was a little bit upset here when they said that the sadism of games like Dark Souls, which is meant to be fought and mastered, I don't think I've ever mastered a Souls game. Now, I can walk through it and know where everything is, but there is no such thing as mastery in a Souls game. Like, you still get punished. You still make these mistakes and and this will get into our topic you that was a big sigh the only the only masters of the soul games in my opinion the only masters of the uh, souls games in my opinion are like you know the speedrunners the ones who can literally do it naked with a dagger in their hand or things you like said that. naked and my first thought was why is a speedrunner naked <laughs> So like Lobos Jr. just doing a, Why a is shield. He naked? Lobos du- Jr. doing a shield run in Bloodborne, stuff like that. Is that mastery? I'm not sure. But 
What I, whereas other games that have patterns that can be memorized and navigated, which is a fair assessment of Souls, the consequences spawned by, by a random number generator are unpredictable and unforgiving. So I think there is a limitation to what a game can accomplish with, an R, uh, with, an R, with RNG as its main component. Because with Darkest Dungeon, as you approach, and that's, that's what this whole article is about, is the end game is too, too RNG based, so mm -hmm. it basically just turns into this uh, slaughterhouse of sorts. For basically you. luck. Right, it gets ridiculous. So I think that something like Souls, although I could never master it, I can get through it and everything, but you get to a certain point with Darkest Dungeon where I think that the RNG takes over too much, and having it's a fine balance between R, using RNG and abusing RNG. And what it sounds okay. like is that as you approach the end of Darkest Dungeon, things really pick up. This reminds me of the learning curve of Tetris. And I think, I know we keep going back, we, we will always go back to Tetris because I think Tetris is like the perfect game. There's, there's a learning curve to Tetris where it, it's basically the levels. It goes slow and it just keeps getting faster and faster and faster until you can't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. So the game, again, an, a random number generator produces the tiles. And then the game increases its own difficulty incrementally until you can't handle it. So you get to this point where you're like mas you're mastering a higher difficulty, and then it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder, mm -hmm. and it, it never you never get to a point where you're frustrated necessarily. You just get to a point where you can't pass because it's just physically impossible for you to go that way. Mm -hmm. and I think I think that with Darkest Dungeon, especially being an RPG game, and especially about being the difficulties and the morality and the darkness of being a dungeon crawler. I think that this lends itself very strongly to the narrative and the actual gameplay itself because you will eventually hit a point where you are too tired or too weak or too few in your party or too drunk or too whatever to handle the gameplay. So I, I think it fits well. Um, making it unbeatable, is that fair? No, but I think it fits. It's fitting. I, I, it's not unbeatable. I shouldn't say it like that. It just being based on luck, I think, fits the structure and the narrative of the gameplay. But I think it alienates a lot of players, a lot like the Souls games do. Unfor unfortunately, the, the but Souls isn't based on luck. The, the, the difficulty of it is what I'm saying. Okay. I, I think the difficulty of the game alienates a lot of players. OSU Nightfall comments on the Kotaku article. Point of order. And I just want to, this is just making me happy. Point of order, Souls isn't sadistic. It has like six unfair moments across three games. True. It does, however, expect you to pay attention and respect it. The greatest Souls skill of all is probably the ability to not just look, but see. That's deep, bro. OSU Nightfall, I tip That's my deep, hat bro. to you. There are not many unfair moments in Souls. But, yes. but going back to the Darkest Dungeon, I get what you mean as far as the randomness. Basically completely aligning like it lacks Luna narrative dissonance because mm -hmm. the gameplay is so Luna narrative dissonance because it, it is grounded in like the, the mechanics and the systems are grounded in the way that it works yeah I just imagine a bunch of like game bloggers like typing the computer like huh huh somebody say did you hear that did someone say peanut butter oh god damn it dude Someone say peanut butter? Did someone say peanut butter? That's enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's basically just my little rant about Darkest Dungeon. Uh, that's basically it. Um, I think that's it for this week. Uh, Without doing discussion? Nah, we covered, we'll talk about we it, covered last it last week, really. We talked about we're, it. We're touching on it lightly. We're just like, eh. Yeah. Eh. Basically, this Super Mario Bros. Uh, speedrun has yet again been broken by a, a glitch. Um, and this just kind of goes back to what I was saying last week with sustainability in video games. A 32-year-old game is still being played obsessively by fans. And thank you. Thank you for that update to our Google Doc. I really needed to see that. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think fans keeping games alive is probably the most uh, noble cause in the game industry. I think that 
the sense of community it's like that comes, Wasteland. Yeah, the, the sense of community that comes from playing games or sharing game experiences is something that is not childish, is not nerdy, is not anything. It's it's just a human. Yeah. It's I mean, a the, human response. I know that you don't want to be cameraman over there, but uh, we should kick it back on. Huh? Yeah. But no, I get what you mean. That's I, it's fascinating that games that should have died like years ago oh, yeah. are just resurrected because there's a hundred people that want to break it in every single way. Yeah. And it's so cool. Pepsi Man. Pepsi Man? Did you not see this Pepsi Man speedrun from GDQ this year? Or in the summer? Well, I think we might have to pull that up. Or not. Go pull a Pepsi I'm Man. I'm not pulling a Pepsi Man. <laughs> is I'm is not it like Sneak Pepsi King? Man. No. I know about Sneak King. Sneaking was ridiculous. That's a pretty good game. No. Uh, Pepsi Man was <laughs> a ja- uh, Japan-only game that Pepsi commissioned from Sony. Which is ironic because the, the only voice acting in Pepsi Man was an American dude who just literally drank like a room full of Pepsi. Oh my god, this is awesome. It's, Wait, literally, it's literally just a runner. It, it's, a, it's an endless runner. Pepsi Man. I shouldn't say an endless runner. It's just a runner where you like... You jump over things. You, you drink Pepsi? Can, yeah, you collect cans of Pepsi. Just down. Everything has a Pepsi logo on it. And it is... It's a game. That's all I can say. It's definitely, it's 100% a game. And it is not at all a fever dream. By no means. It is, it is definitely not a fever dream. Ugh. So that's it for this week. <laughs> uh, tune in every Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Give or take a couple of minutes. Twitch.tv underscore, not, twitch.tv slash night owl underscore games. Very good at talking. I've been awake for like many hours as many followers as we have right now yeah or well, viewers like five hours I got up at eight you did good thanks you did good son yeah I want you to know you did good thanks dad subscribe to our channel youtube.com slash circular waffle again <laughs> fifth grade was a dark dark time for all of us yeah we fucked up <laughs> I fucked up uh, twitter.com slash nido underscore games yet again uh, you can find me anywhere on the internet at Manic Maelstrom. Uh, you don't really social media that much, do you? If, if you do, I'm it's, gonna, it's either I'm Mr. Not plug myself right or now. Cothermand. 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 We, we have our stuff. Yeah, stuff. we have our stuff. Uh, thank you once again for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. As always, I am Matthew. And only sometimes, Dan. See, I don't even know what... Uh... No, let's talk about that. Why why are you uh why are you doing this to me? Good night.